From a beautiful mind to master and commander, LA Confidential to his Oscar winning performance in Gladiator, he always delivers. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Russell Crowe. <laughs> Reaction on your entrance, eh? Yes, what, what, what's the line? A warm hand on your opening? A warm hand on your opening. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm just rolling my sleeves up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no need to apologise. Um, so, Russell, you're in the UK a lot at the moment, it seems to me, because I know you were over earlier in the year. You decided not to go to the Oscars, I believe, because you wanted to go up to St Helens. In an yeah, I don't know if you guys play. know, but nine years ago I, I bought a majority share in my childhood rugby league team, the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Um, they were a championship team when I was a kid, but uh, they'd got into a situation where they'd just become perennial losers, and uh, I got absolutely sick of it. So I put some money down, took over, and step by step we've changed the culture of the club, took them from being perennial losers to being competitive, competitive to being dominant, and last year... On the 5th of October, we won the NRL Championship the first time in 43 wow. years. <laughs> what a result, though. Yeah, it's fantastic. And then that gives us, if you're the NRL champion, if, if you're a league followers or not, I'm not sure, then you get to play the ESL champion, and this year that happens to be St Helens. So earlier in the year, we played St Helens at their home ground, and St Helens a master score of zero, and uh, we put together 39... Wow. So we won that trophy too. That's incredible. That's like <laughs> that is like the plot of a movie. You can see that being in, it made into a movie. There's a team down on the luck, and then a movie guy comes out and buys it, and he turns them around and he makes them a success. But is there is it true? I've heard talk that you might be interested in doing the same thing over here for Leeds. That you've I've, been, uh, I've followed approaching. Leeds United since I was a kid. The same thing. So I've had the same emotional connection. I love that club, and I want only success for that club. So there is a there is a very real. I'm possibility. getting a little bit impatient. Waiting for, you know, getting the, the, the team to stand up and get back into the, the Premiership where they absolutely belong. But that's great because we like you over here, so you spending more time here looking after the team, that would be a good thing. And that would be a great thing for Leeds. If you can it's do a, for them what you've done for your team. It's a very complicated situation and there's a yeah, lot we know. of questions that's fine. to be asked. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back. I was watching TV uh, about ten days ago and Gladiator was on again. And I'm pretty sure it's on somewhere <laughs> in the world all the time. It's, it's, it's a crazy thing. Yeah. And, I, and I haven't seen it for a while. I got straight sat back into it, loved the movie. What a great performance, a great film, all that course. Cool. But that was the moment for you when everything changed, really. I mean, you've been acting... And everything went pear-shaped, as well, they say. Well, when were you aware? When did you suddenly think, hold on, this has had this sort of effect, this impact on my life? Um, you know, it was very comfortable to be famous after L.A. Confidential. You know, it was sort of... That was the sort of thing where all the cool kids saw that film. It wasn't a gigantic hit, but if you wanted to go to a restaurant, you know, the girl at the restaurant, she'd seen the movie, hello, Mr Crow, how are you doing? You know, or nightclub or whatever, and it was, it was fine. When Gladiator expanded things to a, a completely different degree. I think the day that I really realised that something was massively different, I was in Rome, actually, and i just walked out of my hotel and I'd gone shopping, and I was in the store, uh, in the, is it the Via Veneto, whatever it's called, and I came out of the, the shop and, like, the whole street, the entire street was full of people. You know, you look that way to the Spanish steps, it was just packed with people, and that way it was packed, and, you know? So I went up to this, one of these cops that was there, because there's cops everywhere with guns, you know? I went up to him, what's going on, you know? And he goes, you, we gladiatore, you are going on. <laughs> Like, and then they all started erupting. This whole street full of people go, Massimo, Massimo. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. But it must be a great feeling as well, wasn't it? Yeah, but scary as shit, yeah. you know? Yeah. I've got, got my little Cartier bag. Oh, well, you're sorry. <laughs> it's a time to be Maximus, isn't it? Hold on a moment. <laughs> you just put me just, wings down. Just bought a watch. That's all. <laughs> it's just a watch. Um, it's interesting because you're quite a contradictory character in some ways because on the surface people think of you as a kind of an, an Aussie. I know you're from New Zealand originally, but kind of, you know, a rough guy and I know you're in touch with that side of yourself. Clearly you wouldn't be able to play someone like uh, the roles we've just discussed, you know, a man of action and decision mm -hmm. and, and not someone who questions himself. But at the same time, you're a pretty sensitive guy in actual fact, aren't you? And you're quite a poetic sort of man. Yeah, well, I write songs and I write poetry and all that sort of stuff, you know, but... The way I, I always makes me laugh, I come here particularly, because they're always talking about, you know, the tough guy of cinema, Russell Crowe, you know, the hard man of cinema. I put 
fucking makeup on for a living. <laughs> you know, it's just like it, it, none of that stuff is is, yeah. is real. You know, so I go to uh, you know various lengths or whatever physically to prepare for roles, and I, I had this thing in my mind with Noah that he was just like uber strong. So I think my my uh, deadlift during that film was 416 pounds. Wow. You know, That's so a lot of weight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We have a lot of bodybuilders in tonight. They respect that <laughs> kind of dedication. Uh, but how do you keep that going on? Because without, you know, saying anything negative, but none of us are getting any younger. You're, are you 50 now? Is that I'm one? 50, yeah. yeah. Turned so 51 in April. You must, it must take more of its toll on your body when you go oh, into those yeah. kind of movies now. But, but see, the thing, that's one thing that you can't kind of explain to people too. Is like, I, I just, I want to be comfortable in my own skin. I want to play the roles that that I'm, I'm suitable for. But you know, you do pick up stuff as you go. You know, I got a situation where. I got no cartilage in my toes anymore. Mm. I got grade four tears in both Achilles, uh, con constant shin splints. I got bone marrow edemas under both knees. I got a degenerating hip. I got a bad lower back. I've got <laughs> ribs that pop off my upper oh. thoracic. Now these are all because not every take works out well. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the one that's in the movie looks like it was good, but you know there might have been a few others where you know I fell off something, something hit me in the head. You know, actually in one of the scene in Gladiator in the the tiger fight, the guy that I was fighting against who had that big helmet on, yeah. I couldn't see. Well, there we have the picture there. He hit me fair in the head with that, that, that axe he was carrying, you know? <sighs> and, like, that was a bell ringer, you know? But as you get older, <laughs> you've got to be a little bit careful about the situations you put yourself into because you slow down, you know? And the negative about slowing down is that you can't save yourself if something goes really wrong. So, yeah, I mean, definitely, as time goes by, I mean, you know, the level of athleticism to do a role like Gladiator, I probably, you know, quite seriously could not achieve that anymore. Uh, but in Noah, you're still out there trading blow for blow with Way Winston, and he's, he's, you know, he's, I know he's a bit older than you, but he's a, a heavy guy and a strong guy. Yeah, yeah, I love Ray. We had, we had that big fight sequence in the movie, and one part of it, when we're shooting it, I, I have to lie on the ground, and he's lying on top of me, right? And, like, that split second just before action, with every take, he'd go, <clears throat> and, like, dig his elbow into my ribs, like, oh, God, oh, no, 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 fight suckers, like, like, like that. Like, after a few takes, I go, Raymondo, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing that for? <laughs> and he goes, very seriously, he goes, I am an older man, you are a younger man, but you should know to be wary of a man like me. <laughs> <laughs> He's still the daddy. <laughs> He's the daddy, mate. <laughs> oh, that's kind of brilliant. Let me talk about the new film, and this is an exciting uh, step in your career, I think, for you. The new film is called uh, The Water Diviner, mm. and uh, this is a film you're not only starring in, you directed. Directed, yeah. This is out on the 3rd of April, and it's a very different thing for you. And I was amazed, because normally when a director... This is your first proper directing job, isn't it? Normally someone goes into a fairly small project, and that mm. would strike me as being sensible. But this has got everything in it. I mean, this has got, it's got an epic sweep and scale, it's got battle scenes in, it's got lots of different locations as well as lots of intimate stuff as well. So you set yourself a pretty huge challenge. Tell everyone what the actual kind of plot is. Well, the plot is there's a man, Joshua Connor, he has... He's a water diviner for, uh, for a living. He's a farmer and he actually uses rods to douse for water because he lives way, way out in the outback in the desert where it doesn't rain for three or four years at a time. He has three sons and they all go off to war and they all get killed or shot in the same day. And the grief of that eventually drives his wife insane and she ends up committing suicide. So now he's got nothing. And based on a graveside promise, he travels from Australia halfway around the world to Turkey, searching essentially for the bones of his sons. Now, it sounds like the journey of a madman, but all these different things happen along the way to, uh, you know, create um, hope and, and also you know, give him a potential new life, so to speak. And it's so clearly, uh, and when you see it, you understand, and it isn't a depressing film, curiously. You managed to pull that off, I think. But it's, uh, it's very obviously an anti-war film. Or certainly Unashamedly an anti-war. Yeah. Anti but uh, at the same time, you know, life is life and you can still find, you know, yeah. a laugh, you know, no matter how desperate... And situations. light them up. But I was wondering whether or not this was something you wanted to do for your boys, because you have... Two sons who are, are they eight and eleven? Is that eight and eleven? Yeah. Charles and Tennyson. Have they seen the movie? Do you... they have actually? And um, funnily enough, a little situation aro arose with my youngest, which I wasn't aware of. You know, we're having a talk about careers, and he said to me, you know, well after after he finishes university, he's going to go and do a couple of battles, and then he's going to come <laughs> back home and like you know probably have a job, something creative, Dad. And I went, um. Go back to the couple of battles thing. <laughs> <clears throat> Why well, you do that? And he goes, oh, to earn money. I said, baby, soldiers 
aren't that well paid. You know, there's some tax benefits for being in the de defence services, but not necessarily, you don't get a lot of money. And he was really confused. He said, really? I would have thought you would have got a, at least a million a battle. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of, if you think about it, you know, oh, yeah, out yeah, of the mouths of babies, you've got a point, you're putting your life on the, on, on the yeah. line. So I explained it to him, and then he saw the film, and then he came to me and said, Dad, can we arrange a situation for my, my mate Ollie, who's my his best friend at school? He's got to see the film too. So we did, and, and Ollie saw the film. And then I said, how did, you know, Ollie like it? And, and he said, oh, it was good, Dad. We've both decided we're not going to go in the army anymore. <laughs> so, so even if it was just that one thing in my own personal life, the three years of, of being connected to this project, yeah. getting my, my, teaching my son that, that war is not glamorous, you know, and that, that soldiers are facing, you know, a serious life and death situation. And, you know, there's unashamedly anti-war sentiment in the movie. But don't misunderstand that because, you know, every April 25th, which is Anzac Day in Australia and New Zealand, which is the day that we stand to recognise the sacrifice, every Anzac Day I will still be there at the dawn service and I will still take that minute silence and I will still offer thanks for the guys that, you know, gave their lives so we can all enjoy the life that we have now. Because I think that's fundamentally very important, the honour that we should give over to the people that serve on our behalf. But still, when you... <laughs> sure, sure. But there, there is a, a conversation that's rather circular that goes with that, because people will always say, when I'm talking about this sort of stuff, you know, but sometimes, you know, wouldn't you say, there are right reasons for war? And my response to that is, surely after this amount of time, Maybe there's a different way of actually posing that question. Well, you would hope, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, but I understand what you're saying. You're anti-war, but not anti the men and yeah, women you who know, serve. Anti-war, uh, but honour the warrior. Yeah.